Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Yvonne Valencourt, and I am the director of the Nantucket Field Station. We are an entity of UMass Boston, and we welcome researchers, scholars, and educators from all sorts of universities, institutions, and agencies. And um, we sit on a, over 100 acres of conservation land owned by the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. Um, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, we uh, welcome people. And one of those people is back again to speak with us um, and joined by uh, a Nantucketer. And uh, Sam is joining us from the um, Cumming School of Veterinary Medicine, which is part of Tufts University. And uh, he will be in discussion uh, during this session with Dr. Malcolm McNabb, who is uh, one of our local doctors here on Nantucket. And um, as much as I would like to keep talking, I will hand it all over to these two gentlemen who I'm really grateful uh, to have here speaking with us this evening about this very important topic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> I first would like to uh, thank the field station because tick-borne disease <clears throat> is usually a major topic on this island. Unfortunately, in the last few months, we've been sort of uh, heads up, heads into uh, PFAS in our wells, uh, coronavirus, and I think we may have sort of forgot about tick-borne disease. In fact, we had a recent spike. We still are in a recent spike of, of the coronavirus. And that is sort of uh, what I'm afraid of is that if we put our guard down, we may see a spike in the tick-borne disease on this island, particularly since it's actually been going down in the last few years. You know, like uh, I've said before, ticks do not social distance and they don't wear masks. And I think what we've done is we sort of let our car guard down a little bit with the coronavirus and we had the spike. So I wanna make sure we emphasize that this is still a problem in that talk and we don't need to let our guard down. And I will give this over to Sam and then I have some questions for him. Well, I don't think we'll let our guard down, especially as long as I'm living anyway. I've been coming out here since 1984. Uh, and in fact, I am sitting in front of the uh, field station dormitory uh, watching a beautiful sunset. But I've spent many, many uh, uh, happy days here. The field station has played a major role in, in our understanding of the ecology and epidemiology of Lyme disease. Uh, and uh, uh, that knowledge uh, has been put to use in, in trying to develop interventions. And so everything that I uh, uh, am going to talk about uh, is based upon facts that came from the field station. Uh, and, and in fact, I'm sitting in my truck in front of the dormitory because I'm here on one of my trapping trips. Uh, I trap June and September, uh, corresponding to the nymphal deer tick and the larval deer tick seasons. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the reason for doing that is to better understand the uh, demography of the mice as well as the ticks. That is, uh, what are the mice doing? How many are there at, in June? How many are there in September? Uh, how many of them are breeding? Uh, how many of them are juveniles? Uh, how many ticks are on those mice? Because they're really the best estimators for the tick population. They go where we cannot. Uh, yes, I spend a lot of time crawling under the poison ivy and the, and the green briar, but they're way better at it than I am, and, and I am sadly uh, getting older. Uh, but uh, uh, I do want to preface this discussion with, with a, a caution that people need to understand that there are things such as short-term methods for reducing risk and long-term methods. Short-term methods are things such as wearing repellent or doing tick checks. Uh, if you stop doing them, the effect goes away immediately. Whereas a long-term approach is something uh, where you do some do an action, uh, you may have to put some investment into that action, but uh, in maintaining it, uh, you're achieving a long-lasting effect. Uh, and I, I like to say this is the long-term approaches are for our grandchildren. They won't benefit us as much, but we really want to do something to make Nantucket a better place for them. Uh, and their children to come visit. Uh, it, all of us don't wanna have to put repellent on or do tick checks or be in fear of walking through the woods uh, every single day. 
And, and that's why we need a mixture of the two. While long-term interventions are being developed, uh, uh, we have to continue to use every single method that we have available for short-term approaches, tick tubes or short-term approaches, four post or deer feeders, uh, short-term approaches, spraying vegetation, short-term approaches, take it away, the ticks come back. But killing deer, if you removed every last deer on Nantucket, you would not have much of a problem. You would have probably 80% fewer ticks uh, and, and by extension, uh, my guess is 80% fewer Lyme disease cases. There's nothing that's gonna eradicate this tick. Uh, and and uh, sadly, no one has adopted uh, uh, deer reduction uh, in a serious manner. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to come up with other long-term approaches uh, as well as new short-term ones. So, so when we discuss what can we do about ticks and preventing tick bites and preventing Lyme disease, one has to imagine uh, uh, what one does for their family today uh, and into the near future uh, and what one does for their future family. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to uh, answer questions uh, and, and maybe even ask a few of my own. You talked about deer reduction. I know this has been a subject of yours for a long period of time. And you've you published a couple of papers, the uh, Great Island, where you showed reduction of deer really correlated with decrease in, uh, in tick numbers. And there was a Cranes Reservation in Mohegan Island off of Maine. But does that experience translate to Nantucket? Those are very small geographical areas. Nantucket is almost is 49 square miles. We have, uh, by estimation by the state, maybe 2,500 deer, 50 per square mile. W will that experience on those smaller remote areas correlate to uh, a deer reduction program on Nantucket? Well, we, we, we only have those as, pre, you know, we have the precedent and the data behind. It's not just those uh, three sites, but it's now extended to maybe six or seven different sites where the, you know, the, the results have been the same. You reduce a deer to a certain number. That is, there's a threshold effect. You need to reduce them to fewer than 10 uh, per uh, square mile uh, in order to see an effect. Uh, uh, Without doing the experiment, we won't know, but Nantucket is a prime candidate because there are no other animals that the tick can feed on as the adult stage, that is the reproductive stage. Each fed female tick will lay 2,000 eggs. What else is the female tick going to feed on? Because it doesn't like rodents. It doesn't like rabbits. Uh, we've looked at probably uh, uh, over 100 rabbits out here on the field station over the years and have come up with a mere handful of adult deer ticks. Uh, they have their own ticks. They're loaded with their own ticks, but not deer ticks. Uh, the occasional uh, tick will feed on, on feral cats. Uh, people are treating their dogs, so dogs are no longer uh, a source of blood to, for ticks to lay eggs with. And in fact, the, the most uh, striking uh, evidence of that is that once upon a time, you could go to the end of Madiket Road uh, and there was a big hill, hill with, a clump of, with a bunch of beach grass on it. And you can find all of these dog ticks sitting there. Dog ticks, as the name suggests, feed upon dogs and other carnivores. The only other, the only carnivore on Nantucket is the dog, other than feral cats. Uh, and uh, once people started using topical uh, preparations to kill ticks on their animals, the dog ticks disappeared. The dog ticks are very hard to find here on Nantucket anymore. So that's proof of concept that if you re remove the reproductive host, either by treatment uh, or the or by other means. Uh, the, the, the ticks can't reproduce very well anymore. Sure, there are a few little pockets here and there where you see dog ticks. My guess is that the owners uh, of the uh, dogs in those neighborhoods may not be as assiduous in applying preventives uh, to their dogs. So uh, let's pretend we could apply a chemical to deer and, uh, and, and remove them from being uh, blood hosts for the adult deer tick, for the female deer tick. Uh, there is such a thing. It's called a four-poster. 
It's a, it's a, a device with four paint rollers that are coated with an oil containing permethrin uh, or a, 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 a fipronil, which is used either, both of those are used as top spot applications for, for dogs to, to, to do exactly that, to kill ticks on dogs. Uh, the deer come into this four poster device to, to get at corn that people put in there. You need to put a bushel in every two weeks and remove all the, the moldy stuff. So it's a very labor intensive thing. They get painted by these rollers and, and in large scale trials that the USDA did, uh, they demonstrated 80, 85% reduction in, in the contamination of the environment by ticks. So it works, but that's a short term method because you need to keep putting corn in and keep putting fipronil or permethrin into the, the paint rollers uh, every single day uh, while the ticks are around and doing it every single year because you'd say, well, but what if we kept killing ticks for a while? Wouldn't they just start disappearing? F the sad fact is one fed female tick lays 2000 eggs. It doesn't take that much reproduction to keep them around. But what we have is a problem. We have too many reproducing ticks. That's why we see so many. There isn't much of a problem when there are only a few ticks, and that was probably the ancestral state. That is, we, we have scoured the colonial literature looking for reports of uh, Lyme disease, you know, the characteristic erythema migrans. No one has come close to finding anything that remotely resembles Lyme disease, probably because it was so rare. It was in little pockets hidden away that nobody ever saw it. And the other thing, of course, is that there weren't that many deer. The colonists uh, uh, killed them all. Uh, the forests were chopped down. Uh, Nantucket was, of course, nothing but sheep pasture. Uh, and uh, 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 so Lyme disease wasn't around, but it doesn't mean that the bacteria that causes Lyme disease wasn't around. And in fact, uh, as part of my doctoral work, we used a new technology back then called polymerase chain reaction and went to museums and found infected ticks from 1942 and infected mice from 1896 from Cape Cod when a generation before we saw human cases. So it was around in little pockets, hidden away because there were very, very few ticks. And that's what we really want to do. We, there's no pretense of eradicating the tick, eradicating the bacterium. It's simply reducing the contamination of the environment uh, to as few ticks as possible so that people rarely get exposed. But uh, uh, the way to do these things uh, are, have generally been short-term methods. Deer reduction, uh, I mean, if you got rid of every single deer on Nantucket, where would they come from to repopulate? They wouldn't. And then the ticks would have nothing to feed on. Uh, I could just go back to four. I, I, you've opened up about six new questions for me. Yeah. <laughs> When, when I went to Shelter Island with a group a few years ago, because they had a very active four-poster uh, program, the physician there, he said he thought they were effective just because there were so many around the island. It reminded people about the disease, and they were much more vigilant in their own personal habitat. And really? there, is a, there was a study that published uh, two or three, four years ago about four posters on the Cape and on the island, and it really wasn't that effective. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, you did, but that the whole ob objective of that study was to see if you could get away with using fewer. So as with anything, you have to apply as directed by the label. And so they were trying to get away with half as many four posters as what the USDA yeah. originally recommended, and it didn't work. But I completely agree with the Shelter Island assessment. The, uh, the, the effect that they saw on ticks was fairly limited, but it had the added bonus of getting people talking about things. And that's why things, uh, 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 presentations like this are so useful is that it might get people thinking, it might uh, uh, get them talking about it uh, and increase their own uh, 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 anti-tick measures. In fact, you mentioned the Great Island experiment. Great Island is that peninsula uh, on Lewis Bay on the left as you're coming out of Hyannis on the steamship. Uh, uh, it's about a square mile uh, in area, uh, and there were 35 to 50 deer per square mile there before 1981. Then 82, 83, 84, uh, a, a number of different methods were, were tried to reduce the number of deer there or, or put chemicals on them. 
or or take them away and put them in somebody else's neighborhood. And of course, you've got the not in my neighborhood thing. So Fish and Wildlife decided to just shoot them. Uh, and they didn't get rid of all the deer. Uh, it went from 35 to 50 animals. And I say 35 to 50 because it's a peninsula. They come on and off as they please. Uh, uh, they went down to six or fewer animals per square mile. And then the caretaker out there was asked to keep the population at that level. And my job as a graduate student in 1984 was to go out there every month, starting in, in, in April. So, you know, I started in, in October of 84. So I really started April of 85, trapping every month from April through October, three days, two nights, and on Great Island and here on Nantucket as the comparison because nothing was being done here, uh, and, and counted ticks on mice. Uh, and the, the numbers were astounding. I mean, 80, 85% reduction in larval uh, infestations on mice uh, and probably uh, 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 70, 60, 70% 70 reduction in nymphal numbers on mice. Uh, uh, the flip side of that is what was the effect on human health? And, and note that Great Island has been maintained at six to 10 animals per square mile. I go back twice a year in, in May and in October and I sample adult ticks and the numbers have remained at very low levels ever since uh, the deer were removed uh, in the mid 1980s. I have 35 years of data uh, that show that they didn't hop on coyotes or foxes or anything else uh, that if you re remove the deer or made it less likely they would encounter a deer, reproduction would remain low. Uh, but the flip side was that I also uh, uh, moonlight as a phlebotomist. And so uh, every July and August, uh, the third Sunday in July, third Sunday in August, the, the family out there on Great Island has a chapel uh, and they come in for a church service. But before they can go into church, they had to stick their arm out for me to bleed them. So we did active case detection out there. And, and in 15 years, we saw maybe two or three cases of Lyme disease out there, whereas previously 16% of the population had experienced Lyme disease. So uh, uh, it does work, uh, uh, but you have to have the motivation to do it. Now here, as you say, it would be a huge job to get rid of 2,500 deer. Right. Uh, I mean, that's, if we, I just to interrupt you. I want to get back briefly to four posters, then we'll go back to uh, yeah to deer. I mean, I think people should understand <clears throat> uh, that four posters. Uh, there's issue of uh, disease spread, but uh, deer wasting disease between deers. They attract rodents. I mean, you're actually giving them free corn to eat. They require a great deal of maintenance. The one on Sheltered Island, they had to keep taping them up because the various animals ate, ate the, uh, the base they were in. They're very expensive and we would have to have them here forever. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's very practical. And there's always the issue of permethrin. I don't know if I want my grandchildren, if I had grandchildren, you know, rubbing against permethrin on those rollers. So to me, <laughs> Four posters is not is not a viable option for Nantucket. No, it, it but Nantucket, certainly uh, certainly deer deer reduction is again. You almost said it's almost hypothesis and be an experiment because we would we still it's a very large area. I'm not saying I'm necessarily against it. I'm just have concerns about whether. The experience in small places would translate to an experience in a large place. And there is the practical aspect of actually doing it. Uh, we have a very short hunting season. We, had a, we have limited hunters on this island. We're building and building more and more houses, which means the firearms restrictions around buildings is actually re reducing the land. Uh, a lot of the land on the island is posted. Uh, and if I'm, we've at times talked to the state about bringing in uh, sharpshooters, uh, professionals, and they don't seem very excited about doing that. Uh, if we extended the hunting season more than it already is, uh, then we would 
has since opened ourselves to off-island hunters. And if you all remember back to 2005, 2006, when the hunting season was extended and the deer population fell, but boy, did we have a problem. I mean, people were walking up Main Street with their shotguns sitting on people's porches. Uh, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to go back to it. So there, there's a scientific will it work question and there's the practical question, if it did work, how could we actually do it here for all those various reasons I just mentioned? I'd love your comment. Yeah, well, you know, I, I actually am fairly certain of the science. Uh, that is, if you reduce the deer out here, you would see fewer ticks and consequentially, uh, in consequence, you would see fewer uh, cases of tick-borne disease. I don't think <clears throat> the science really is, is up for debate given the consistency with which we've seen uh, the results in, in all other uh, studies. Uh, save one, which was on the mainland, and they actually uh, 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 didn't even get the number of deer down reduced to what we saw pre-intervention on Great Island. So they didn't reduce the deer herd uh, far enough. Uh, but uh, you're right, there are tremendous logistical issues with removing every you know, as, as many deer as you can out here while maintaining uh, them as an as a resource. That is, that's why fish and wildlife is negative about sharpshooters is because they're stewards of the resources for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and a sharpshooter means taking away those resources from from every citizen um, citizen of Massachusetts. What do you, you know? Yes, you, you could have a one time distribution of venison to the to uh, homeless uh, shelters and things like that. But uh, then there would be no such resource for Nantucket uh, and people who visit Nantucket forevermore. Uh, and so they would prefer to see some way of managing the resource. Uh, and you can do that. You can, you can manage the, the deer herd so that uh, uh, may, maybe it's, you'll have to work harder to get your deer, uh, but even that might have a, a, a good effect on the tick population itself. Uh, uh, the, but the, the, the point is one should not conflate logistical issues with scientific issues. I think the science is there, but the logistics means that it's probably not practical. And, you know, I've, I've pretty much given up get, uh, trying to do deer reduction out here. I have one, uh, uh, ace in the hole that I'm working on, uh, which is, uh, uh, imagine if you will, uh, if people here, could use deer as a better resource. That is, uh, how much do you think uh, uh, American Seasons or any of the restaurants on Nantucket uh, could charge for a plate of Nantucket venison? Uh, today, you cannot do that. It is illegal to sell venison harvested uh, during hunting uh, or any other means. Uh, however, uh, that goes back to legislation, federal legislation, the Meat Inspection Act. It's not because deer a venison is unhealthy and can't be inspected. Uh, venison is in fact, one of the healthiest meats you could find. It is the provision in the Meat Inspection Act that the mode of killing be inspectable. And of course that takes hunter killed venison out. You cannot inspect the mode of killing. So why can't we change the Meat Inspection Act so that deer are exempted from the provision of uh, uh, needing to inspect the mode of killing. Then you could still have USDA uh, uh, veterinary inspectors uh, place their stamp of approval on uh, a meat that is butchered correctly and within uh, facilities with a HACCP, with a, with a risk management program. Uh, and, and even uh, I would even suggest a commercial season on deer like we have for some of the uh, fish that we have in the waters around Nantucket to let the, the people who might benefit from more income to use the resource uh, and thereby reduce the deer that way. So I, I am working on crafting legislation to try to do that. Uh, apparently it's expensive. It'll cost a hundred grand just for the lobbyist to, to put his foot in the door of the right people. Uh, but uh, that's a possibility. There are exemptions in the Meat Inspection Act. You can sell alligator 
that you harvest in Florida, for example. So, so why not deer? So uh, one of the issues with game management, with managing deer uh, the way mass wildlife would like to do it is that hunting is sadly a dying sport. Uh, even my own kids have absolutely no interest in hunting. Uh, uh, and as you say, it's becoming much more difficult to use firearms given housing density. In fact, most of Eastern Massachusetts uh, is not huntable because there is a 500 foot setback uh, from firearms discharge for any inhabited dwelling. It takes away, it, each house takes away 18 acres of huntable land. And so it's gotten much more difficult. However, uh, archers, uh, we need to train a new generation of hunters to, to be archers. Uh, the, the Native Americans were perfectly effective using archery uh, to hunt uh, a deer. And so there, there are ways to look at this in a little different light. Uh, but the, the, the old way where, where we went, you know, in the mid, to, mid 2000s, where we tried to enhance the take of deer by having a special season, uh, it would have worked. Mass Wildlife, in fact, had said, if you continue to take 200 deer each February for another three years, the, the population growth would be on a negative slope, uh, which is what we want. We don't want to get rid of the deer uh, right away, we want a, a gradual decrease in their numbers because if you take them all away at once, if the Martians came and, and took a spaceship and sucked all the deer up, what would happen with all of those ticks out there? They'd be looking for something to, to crawl onto and that would be people. Uh, so you could increase risk if you harvested too many animals at once. Now you could give them a one-two punch, you could kill all the deer and then spray, but spray is a dirty word out here too. Uh, spray does have its uses. So uh, uh, there are ways uh, for those people who want to do it, there are ways of doing it if they think carefully enough, think out of the box a little bit. Okay, thank you. That's sort of, there's, I have a comment and a couple more questions in that. Yes, people often ask me if we got rid of the deer, then there would just be more ticks on people, but I'm not sure any of us would tolerate, uh, you know, 200 ticks on us at a given time. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that would be a major problem. Uh, you also mentioned spraying. I wanted to get back to that. Is spraying our lawns uh, with permethrin, uh, is that safe? Uh, you wouldn't spray your lawns. Uh, the, these there are, are, there are people that spray their lawns with permethrin. Well, they shouldn't be. Uh, uh, it, it's not something that should be done with a spray. Uh, I know the commercial applicators like sprays because uh, it means they have to come back uh, frequently. The, the, the pyrethroids are very sensitive to sunlight. They break down, their, their half-life is about three days in sunlight. Uh, and so uh, uh, if you can get good knockdown with a spray, but a lot of the ticks are hiding beneath the leaf litter where the spray isn't going to hit. And so after the, per uh, the pyrethroid gets uh, uh, broken down by sunlight, those ticks will just come right back up. And so you have to reapply frequently. What the, the, the peer-reviewed publication has shown is that granular form for formulations of pyrethroids are what you need to do get it down into the leaf litter where, it, where the, the compounds are not gonna affect pollinators. So that's the negative about spraying is that you're killing beneficial insects such as bees and wasps. Uh, uh, but if you put it down in the leaf litter with a broadcast spreader, uh, it leaches out gradually and kills the ticks that are hiding in the leaf litter without affecting bees. And so that's the way uh, Kirby Stafford at the, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station did a number of experiments that show the efficacy, the great knockdown power of using uh, granular pyrethroids. You apply once uh, in May to knock down the nymphs, you apply once in July to knock down the larvae, and you can apply once in, in uh, early October to knock down the adults. And you just have three applications a year. And uh, because it's, it's in the leaf litter, broadcast into areas where there's less sunlight, the, the product doesn't de degrade as, as quickly. Uh, so that would be the way to do it. Uh, obviously, being a pyrethroid, uh, the, the, the compounds are 
you should not use them within 150 feet of wetlands of any sort, including uh, marine wetlands. Right. And so right. the, the places where you could use pyrethroid, granular pyrethroids is relatively limited on Nantucket. But nonetheless, there's no reason you shouldn't apply them around the, your, you know, the shrubs in your yard, uh, around playgrounds, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, everybody says, oh my God, chemical around playgrounds. Note that permethrin is the active ingredient in NYX, which is the treatment of choice for head lice of children. Uh, you put it on as a 0.5 to 1% concentrated uh, shampoo, and you're instructed to leave it on your kid's head for 30 minutes. So that shows you how dangerous it would be to, to put permethrin or other pyrethroid granules around a, uh, around a playground. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's pretty safe for humans, but I understand uh, aquatic species don't do so well with it. And in an island where we're having a, enough problems with our, our ponds and our, and our harbors and so forth, I'm just a little concerned. But am I right, Sam, it has a, a fairly short half-life? It does. It does. Now, remember, that's, it breaks down in sunlight. Uh, and, and obviously there's some more, you know, uh, uh, bio uh, de degradation that's going on, but it, I, I'm not familiar with it, but it's possible that once it reaches water that it could become state, you know, it wouldn't degrade as fast. So, so completely agree that, that it should not be applied anywhere near where it could leach into water that contains uh, life that we care about. And we have a very sandy soil. Almost everything that goes out into the ground ultimately gets into our harbors and our uh, ponds. And that's still a concern of mine. Just, I wanna backtrack a little bit when you talked about commercial use of venison. Uh, if you, I know if you're aware or the island aware, we did have, unfortunately, cut sort of sidetracked this year because of all the other craziness going on here of uh, donating uh, meat to the food bank uh, that's approved by the state and, and goes through a, an inspection of sense uh, under direction of our local board of health. So there are, there are ways to distribute the meat, but that's just on a very limited scale. No, and, and I think that was a fantastic uh, uh, example of what can be done within the existing regulations. Uh, and, and my guess is that there was probably a, an uptick, a, a, an increase in the number of deer taken uh, during those hunting seasons when you had that program running. Uh, one of the big issues with hunters is they're not going to take more animals than they can, can use. Uh, there's no sport yes. with killing an animal. And if you give them that outlet, no one is going to argue that uh, providing meat to the needy uh, should not be done. It was, I would call, moderate, success, moderately successful. <clears throat> Excuse me again. So, just just to go on a little bit. Last time, you know, I, I wasn't there, but I was. Uh, you, a question was asked. I asked you that since we're having, if you look at the statistics of the incidence of Lyme disease on the island, it seems to be going down, and and certainly that may have some relation to. Uh, underreporting, and I certainly think, as you've mentioned it before, a lot of people have their own store of doxycycline at home and they get bit by a tick, they take a pill. So they're not even getting into the system to get reported or even going to the physician. But those are the numbers we have to deal with. And those are the numbers we have to make decisions about, or like whether we reduce the deer, whether we introduce genetic mice. I, I guess my concern is, I'd love you to comment just briefly, you did before about what you think about that. But my concern, as I said at the beginning, uh, that with more people going outside, uh, see there is sort of a link between COVID and there is a link between tick-borne disease. We let our guard down, we don't wanna let our guard down here. But more people going outside and we had a pretty mild and wet winter and spring, which correct me would sort of, uh, the ticks would like very much. So are we gonna see, we've seen a spike in a Corona, are we gonna see a spike in tick-borne disease? Yeah, well, you, you, I'm hoping that your 
you and Roberto are able to compile uh, uh, data for this year. Sadly, the state, uh, the Department of Public Health has gone away from their, uh, t their routine surveillance program. That is, they used to, uh, uh, ag not aggressively, but they had a very formal system for reporting and confirming cases of Lyme disease. And it's been done that way for 30 years. And, and but now, uh, as of two years ago, they went away from that, uh, uh, partly with the argument that it really doesn't help anything in real time. Uh, but I completely agree that uh, we see this on the vineyard too. We, for the last three years, the numbers of Lyme disease cases have been going down. Uh, and I think that's the case on Nantucket as well. I actually attribute that to uh, the, the one or two tab doxycycline. That is, not only are people more familiar with that, but physicians when confronted by a patient uh, who brings in a tick or says, I was bitten by a tick, doesn't even ask questions. Here's your two tabs, go away. Uh, and that clearly, uh, uh, it was the subject of a, a placebo controlled trial published in the New England Journal reduces risk of acquiring Lyme disease by 85%. It's what those of us who work with ticks have been doing forever. Uh, I take prophylactic doxycycline that one or two tabs maybe twice a year because I get a bite, uh, despite all my precautions. But then again, I'm, I'm crawling under the bushes. Uh, so I think that's a major contributor, but I, I also can't discount the fact that there's much more information out there. You uh, and, and the Board of Health have become very aggressive in, in, in educating as we've done over on the vineyard as well. That certainly helps. Uh, but to look at those, numbers and, and, and question whether we really need to pursue interventions, I think is, is, is short-sighted. I, I really hope that we continue to see a downward trend or at least hold uh, stable at fewer cases than typical. Uh, this year might be interesting because as you say, there are more people out uh, uh, because of COVID, they're walking the trails uh, and the public health messaging around COVID may have taken their minds off of the fact that they still need to protect themselves against ticks. Uh, the ticks that, that, you know, I come out and I, I look at the tick numbers, there were a few more ticks this year than there were last year or in previous years. Uh, it was actually a pretty good uh, year for nymphal ticks. Uh, Tim Lepre says that there probably were 100 cases of Lyme disease at the hospital this summer, which is, you know, a little on the, the high average size side. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, I'm hoping that when all is said and done, it, it hasn't doubled, it hasn't, uh, uh, it's not 30% more, it's, it's within the range of normal variation that we see uh, in, in terms of, of, of Lyme disease cases. But we continue to need to look at the future. Uh, yes, we expect, I expect there will be a Lyme disease vaccine available for humans in 2024. The Valneva product uh, is, is completing a phase two and, and they've got an accelerated uh, development track uh, and FD, uh, for FDA approval. So that'll be a, a tool, but it doesn't negate, uh, uh, it doesn't do anything for the other uh, four uh, tick-borne infections that are found here on, on, on Nantucket. Uh, and so we continually have to think of ways to reduce the tick population, to enhance personal protection and, and knowledge about protection, uh, and futuristic long-term uh, uh, ways of reducing uh, risk out here. Thank you. Some of those, uh, some of those other long-term preventions, uh, there's been recently, I believe, introduced uh, a vaccine for for mice where they take it and feed. Uh, I've looked at some of that data. I wasn't horribly impressed, but uh, I was wondering mean. if you if you had a <laughs> if you had a comment on that. But it's I think it's approved commercially now. It is uh, approved commercially. Uh, the the reports uh, the 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 scientific publications that came out of those trials uh, were not terribly convincing to me. Uh, maybe there's an effect. Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, it'd be a good use of money to, to try that product. Uh, but nonetheless, the approach has merit. That is to use bait, 
uh, to deliver something to mice that will either affect ticks uh, or the bacteria within the ticks. And, and in fact, uh, for the longest time, we had a, a competing product. Uh, US Biologics had one which was just fed to mice as a protein. We had one which was a, a live vaccinia virus that would deliver the uh, uh, OSPE antigen directly to mice uh, by viral replication. Uh, vaccinia virus is what's used for the rabies vaccine that's distributed uh, in raccoon populations. Very, very effective uh, in presenting antigen to, to animals. Uh, we were actually gonna run a trial uh, on one of the islands nearby, but uh, we needed to apply for federal uh, uh, oversight. USDA put a, a roadblock in our way because uh, they wanted the virus tested, the master seed virus tested for all sorts of opportunistic inf uh, infections uh, to make sure there was nothing else that was gonna be introduced. Uh, and sadly, the classical way of doing it is to neutralize the virus and then let the cells that the virus was, uh, is growing in grow on and then test the cells for other in infections. We couldn't neutralize the virus. Vaccine is a very hardy thing uh, uh, in the immune response. And, and so uh, there was no way to give USDA the, the data they needed for them to give us a permit to, for a field release. So well, it's, a, it's a, the product's approved and it, I think it'll have a more, more tests in the field. The uh, US biologic well, thing? Yeah, yes. we'll, we'll, we'll see. see. I, we'll see. We'll but, see. Uh, we are uh, approaching it a different way now. Uh, we had the infrastructure set up for a vaccinia trial, and, and if that's not going to go uh, uh, on, there's now a different approach. CDC years ago did what I consider to be an unethical experiment. They delivered doxycycline and baits to rodents and saw that the, the number of infected ticks went to zero. I mean, it was very, very effective. But of course, you don't want to be using your frontline drug uh, in the environment uh, so that uh, perhaps uh, bacteria could uh, 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 develop resistance to it. But uh, a new venture that we have, a, a collaboration between uh, uh, Northeastern University and, and uh, Tufts Medical School and, and, and us, uh, we're going to be testing a drug that has no clinical application whatever, uh, which has been demonstrated to kill the Lyme disease bacteria and put that in bait uh, and see how that does. Uh, and that way, there's no uh, uh, cross resistance to other clinically useful drugs. Uh, and so it's, it, it may be uh, yet another tool that we may have out there to try to attack the, the mouse reservoir. Good. Well, we're kind of getting on with time. Maybe I'll go back to Yvonne. I mean, I, I could sit here for another two hours, but <laughs> people tell me your attention span is only 40 minutes or something like yeah. that. So. Yeah. We have another 10 minutes. If you so want do you have, any, you have any questions? I, I have to say one thing, and then I'll give it back to the, the host. Something you said before in the last session, I want, I want to tell you I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with you you talked about uh, <clears throat> making vaccines in basements uh, you know like Lyme vaccine in basements because it's it's not approved you know but there, there is there is this thing called a good manufacturing practice which sort of puts a standard on how you make things to me it would be like uh, going to the restaurant and, and getting a meal and they didn't have an approved commercial kitchen. And you remember a couple of years ago, there was some compounding of uh, a drug and people ended up with uh, a fungal meningitis. So I get very nervous when I hear about people making their own drugs well, uh, it's, it's not in, a a not, in, in a not approved lab, so. Yeah, well, you know, there are, there are basement uh, recombinant insulin labs. Uh, people are fed up with the high price of, of insulin. Yeah, well, that's what you mentioned. I, I just I just think that's extremely dangerous. It is, but it's a new way of thinking about things. But I'd like to sort of uh, uh, shift the discussion slightly to, to sort of update people on the genetically modified mouse project. It is our up, well, up another up, 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 up to our host. I. I I'm going to turn it back to her. 
<laughs> the, it is another possible long-term approach and, and uh, one uh, that is, uh, uh, Kevin Esfeld and Joanna Buchthal have made pretty good progress in, in making a mouse. It's not the white-footed mouse, but it's a laboratory ver mouse. But the technology uh, that they've developed to, to make mice overexpress anti ospa antibody seems to be working in laboratory mice, which means now there's a push to uh, 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 do this for white-footed mice. So they're eating up my colony of white-footed mice. They have their own colony. They're eating those up because you need embryonic stem cells from those mice. Uh, and we've just been so grateful that the Rainwater Foundation has seen the, the future. That is, it's not just about Lyme disease. And I, I have a background in tropical public health. And uh, there are infections that are rodent maintained for which this kind of method could be very, very useful. And for us to be doing this in a pioneering experiment to show proof of concept that you can modify a natural population uh, and then maybe use this to attack things like Lassa hemorrhagic fever uh, in West Africa, where uh, it's one of the major killers of, uh, of physicians and nurses in hospitals because uh, it's nosocomially transmitted. It can be transmitted from the patient. Uh, by the time people come in uh, uh, with loss of fever, uh, they're, they're in pretty bad shape and uh, without barrier uh, 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 protection uh, of the personnel, uh, uh, they get it and they get debilitated or they, or they die. We could attack loss of fever with something like a genetically modified mouse. And the biggest problem with new technologies in developing countries is that the, there's uh, always this ethical issue of, of, of trying to do it in people who really don't understand what's going on. And so this is the reverse. We're coming to an extremely well-educated, very rich population and trying the, the method out here first. And so Nantucket can proudly say, if, if we're successful with this experiment, that we contributed a platform technology that could be used to attack rodent-borne infection across the world in, in poor countries. So, so I take a big picture of this uh, besides the fact that, yes, it could do something interesting for Lyme here. It could reduce a Lyme risk here, uh, but it is just one of many other tools that we need to consider. We should use as many tools as we can to attack the problem. We still need repellents. We still need permethrin treated clothing. We still need to check ourselves for ticks. We need to you know, use insecticides judiciously around homes. We need to manage hosts such as deer, uh, but also remain open to the future to try to always have something in the pipeline. And so that's where the, the, the mouse against tick, mice against ticks project is, is that there is progress uh, thanks to uh, uh, the Rainwater Foundation and their funding, uh, uh, we're, we're that much closer to, to achieving this. Uh, but it's still years away from deployment and there are regulatory and ethical issues that really need to be solved before we could even bring it to Nantucket for a vote. Uh, so in the interim, always, always check yourself for ticks. Wear permethrin treated clothing. It's probably the single most useful thing you could be doing to protect yourself against ticks. Uh, check yourself for ticks. Be aware of any fever and go get that checked out. And remain open to things such as using ins insecticides judiciously. Remain open to uh, reducing your deer herd by whatever means you can uh, within the current legislative uh, and regulatory environment or with an eye to the future trying to change some of that regulatory environment. But again, don't place your eggs in the one basket. Maybe there'll be a Lyme disease vaccine, but that doesn't mean that you, you can stop protecting yourselves against tick bites because babesiosis is out there. Babesiosis kills people. Uh, anaplasma, Borrelia miyamotoi disease, and Powassan virus, they're all here. Fortunately, they're less common than, than Lyme disease. Uh, although babesiosis seems to be increasing in incidence, but I think some of that is due to the fact that Lyme is decreasing in incidence due to the prophylactic doxycycline, which has no effect whatever on babesia. So with that, again, uh, think to the future, always keep doing things uh, to, to protect yourself. And, and it's not all about COVID, but you know, obviously that, that is a major public health issue, our major public health issue right now. 
Wow, this is um, so much to think about. And um, I thank you both very much. I know we could keep asking questions <laughs> and talking for many more hours. Um, and there's that much information to get into. Um, so we'll leave something though for future talks. And I know you'll continue to be monitoring and this will be something that we all on Nantucket and in the Northeast are grappling with. Um, it's been um, really interesting and a lot to think about. Um, and I greatly appreciate the fact that both of you have taken the time to spend um, discussing these things at length and educating all of us. Um, so I would like to just thank you once again and remind people that if you want to watch this another time, these will be available on YouTube. Um, we, we record these and post them. Sometimes it takes a day uh, to make it available once again, um, but you can watch this um, anytime you want to. And you can also watch the previous um, seminar that uh, Sam Telfer gave. And with Vanny Lark, we'll be uh, offering more on this theme. And so I welcome comments and questions. Um, you can put them on YouTube in the comments section underneath the video, um, or you can reach out to any of us and uh, let us know what you think. Um, thank you. Sam and thank you, Malcolm, very much. I truly well, thank you for the app. Thank you for the opportunity. As I said, thank we can't you. forget about tick-borne disease. Right. We'll see you, Malcolm. Take care.